Um, this is designed for developers. Um, I guess the idea for this talk came about um, because I've worked with a lot of developers um, and do, um, and they've asked me just to kind of share some tips and tricks um, on how to create better UI design. Um, in some cases, they have been working on something and they don't have a designer, so they've kind of had to be the designer. Um, and other times, it's just because they want to expand their skill set. Um, so whether you are a developer or a designer, a combination of both or something else entirely, hopefully there's something in here uh, that's helpful for you. So just a quick intro into who I am. My name's Lex Lofthouse. Um, I go by she, her pronouns, and my handle on just about everything is at Loftiel. So if you want to tweet, go ahead. Um, I've been a designer for over a decade now. Uh, my dad taught me Photoshop in my early teens, which was the downfall, really. Um, I went on to study graphic design at uni, um, and then I ultimately made the move into design agency world. Um, so I currently work for a Nottingham agency called Enzyme. Um, so before we kind of kick off, I just want to manage expectations. Um, <laughs> this is quite a short presentation, so I can't teach you absolutely everything I know. Um, and I also won't be giving any code-based tips, because believe me, I don't know shit about code, really. <laughs> I, I tried. I tried. Uh, but I'm going to cover the following. So some principles of design, so kind of rules to follow. Um, tips around different design elements, so the kind of building blocks that make up designs. Um, and then finally, some before and after kind of screens to show how we can refine existing designs. So let's start with those principles of design. So there's no kind of hard and fast rules on how many principles there are. Um, like Florence mentioned, Design Twitter would love to argue with you about that. Um, but I've picked four that are going to be um, a bit of an anchor when it comes to designing and maybe you're feeling a bit stuck. Um, so those are hierarchy, proximity, contrast, and balance. Um, so let's look into those. Start with hierarchy. So similar to how we uh, think of hierarchy in other aspects of the world, it's a system in which things are arranged according to their importance. Uh, good design will visually indicate to you that clear hierarchy of content. So it's a relatively simple principle to implement within design because there's a few ways to do it. Uh, one of the easiest methods is scale. You know, the biggest thing on the page is going to be the most prominent and at the top of that. Um, so if we think about, say, how we set up heading styles in development, we give them hierarchy in their names, H1, H2, H3, and so on. Uh, and visually, in design, um, we set up the styles with H1 being the largest, H2 the next, and uh, so on. Then we have proximity. So um, proximity, when it comes to design, is looking at the content, understanding the relationships that those uh, pieces of content have with each other, uh, and then placing them on the page um, in a way that conveys that. Uh, so the distance or the lack of distance between uh, objects, uh, that kind of helps humans decide what things belong together, what things are in groups, um, and they can form connections um, between that content. So uh, to use text as an example again for this, if you've got heading and you've got a paragraph of text saying right underneath it, you can safely say that those two things belong to each other, that heading is going to introduce that paragraph of text. Uh, our third is contrast. Uh, now, contrast is achieved by having things be the opposite to each other or close enough to appear opposite. Um, and it's in order to create a sense of emphasis. So one way that we can use contrast in design is to highlight an element uh, on a page against something else. So we can use that contrast to draw the user's eye um, to a certain place on the page first. And in some ways, that kind of relates back to the hierarchy principle. In fact, all these principles kind of mix together a little bit. Um, and other times, we can use contrast just as a really crucial part of the UI, um, especially when it comes to, say, accessibility. Um, we can use high cost contrast in colors uh, when it comes to making text really easy to read, you know, white text on a black background or vice versa. 
Um, so we can use color, we can use scale and styles in order to create contrast. Uh, and then the last one is balance. So this is the distribution of visual weight across a screen. So this approach here is uh, symmetrical balance. So this is where all of your elements are equal and they're distributed equally uh, across the page, often with a kind of invisible center line uh, down the middle. It's quite balanced set of scales approach. And this offers a nice aesthetically pleasing layout. It's got consistency and it's pretty easy to get right. Uh, very common in the way that we structure web pages uh, these days. There is also asymmetrical balance. So asymmetrical balance is used when you want to uh, draw the user's eye more towards one side, side of a design, but still maintain that sense of balance. So in this kind of example, you have one large element that weighs the same as four smaller elements. Um, still balance, just a visually different approach. So that's our four principles. The idea with these is keep them in mind. Um, they are the kind of key to creating a good design. So always kind of come back to these if you're feeling stuck. And if we're talking in terms of uh, Lego, these are the instructions. And now I want to introduce some of the actual Lego blocks um, on there. So I'm going to call them design elements. I can't think of a better name. Um, but I'm not going to, again, go into the detail of everything, but I've just picked out some kind of good tips that I think uh, will be useful. So again, like our principles, um, there are more elements, design elements, um, but I want to cover kind of four today, uh, which is typography, color, imagery, and layout. Um, so let's start with typography. So typography is not all about fonts, but it does start there. Um, so depending on what you're working on, you might need to choose some fonts. You might have to totally start from scratch. So where do you start? Um, typically, I would suggest choosing a font pairing. So I'll call that like easy mode. So you choose one font for your headings and choose one font for your paragraph, your body copy. Uh, it keeps things really simple. Uh, you don't have to worry too much about uh, things. So headings, headings can be quite bold. You've got an opportunity to be braver with headings. Um, you know, this is shorter, larger, and more attention-grabbing bits of copy. So this can be a bit more decorative uh, or stylized choice of font you can choose here. Whereas with paragraphs, you've got to play it a bit safer. Uh, we need to choose a kind of simpler font. It's going to be smaller. It's going to be in big paragraphs, so it has to be easy to read. Um, but how do you choose these fonts? Sure, you've got to choose a font pairing, but how do you do that? Uh, and that all comes down to knowing the brand that you're working for. Um, so fonts, especially that heading font, uh, should either embody the brand or kind of complement the tone and style of the brand. So um, I've put together just a few examples to explain this. Um, so this is an example for, this is for Nottingham Castle. I've picked some things that are close to uh, where I live. So, this is just a bit of copy about Nottingham Castle, um, but this location, it has history. Um, it has that kind of heritage to it. So the heading font I've chosen uh, echoes the kind of style of type from that era. It's got some nice character to it, and it embodies the brand. Um, and then to complement that, I've chosen this kind of classic serif font. Um, while it's still kind of got a bit of tone of history, it's a lot easier to read at smaller sizes. Um, and it pairs really well with that heading font. So that's an example there. Second example, um, this is for a contemporary art gallery, again in Nottingham. Um, so this time, for the heading font, we've chosen something a bit bolder. Um, it's quite eye-catching, but again, it represents that gallery's modern style. Um, and here I've paired it with quite a basic uh, sans-serif font. Um, again, it complements that kind of modern style, um, but without being um, difficult to read. Um, and this sort of paragraph font, um, I, think, I think I've chosen Open Sans for this. Uh, it works, it's quite versatile, it works with a hell of a lot of brands. Um, and then this last example here is like the other end of the spectrum, I guess. So this is for a trampolining center that's aimed at kids. <laughs> yes, I have been. Uh, <laughs> 
I don't have kids either. Um, for that heading, it is a fun, handwritten font. So it's got that kind of childlike playfulness to it. It helps convey that brand tone. Um, and then the paragraph font um, that I've accompanied it with pairs really well with it. It's got nice rounded edges. It's still got a bit of playfulness to it, but it's easy to read at smaller sizes. So there isn't always one answer when it comes to choosing fonts. In fact, in design entirely, there's not always one answer, um, but there are some wrong ones. So if you're not sure, play it a bit safer in your choices, but if you want to create a bit more impact, then you can get brave, especially with that kind of heading choice. So I've got a load of resources in this slide deck, so I will post it out so you don't have to capture the slides as they come. Um, but this is a really nice tool to try out some font choices together. Um, it's called fontjoy.com. Uh, and you can randomly generate font matches, and it will do like headings. It does like a subheading as well, and um, paragraph style. Um, the great thing about this is that you can just preview it all in a browser. You don't have to download these fonts and faff about with them. Um, and it uses Google fonts, which you know can be quite favorable if you're working on something low budget or you know, free. Um, I won't go into detail about setting up styles, like heading styles and uh, paragraph styles and things like that. But I do want to point out this great tool that helps with it. It's type-scale.com, yes. Um, it integrates with Google Fonts too, but it's great because once you've got your heading and your paragraph um, fonts, you can have a look at this, preview styles. Again, you don't have to download anything, so um, it's really useful for that. You can set up different, uh, the hierarchy, we'll come back to that um, principle there. You can set up them styles. Um, and preview them in there. So once we've got our fonts, we've set up some styles, um, I would like to discuss spacing. Uh, to me, as a designer, this is probably the most overlooked detail by developers, and I'm really sorry, but it is. Uh, <laughs> it makes a world of difference to the, to the design getting this right. So I want to talk about line height and paragraph spacing here. So firstly is line height. So this is the space between continuous lines um, on the page in paragraphs. So here's three examples of that. Um, so this kind of shows three different line heights. It's a bit of a Goldilocks situation. And I want to show this to kind of demonstrate the power of getting that balance right. So on this end of the scale, this line height is too small. Um, the text is quite bunched together, um, and it makes it really difficult to read. Um, and sometimes this can be our default line spacing, so we've got to have a look at it and change it and increase that. Trouble is, then we get to this kind of level, um, and we go a bit too far. We can fall into this trap. Um, this is how I used to behave as a junior designer. Uh, I used to think that this was acceptable, and my boss would say, you could fill a bus through those lines. Um, <laughs> So yeah, that's too far um, down the other end of the spectrum. So this middle example here is more along the lines of where we want to be. You know, this makes it a lot more pleasing to read. There's enough space between the lines, but not too much. Um, so proximity is the principle we need to remember here, uh, especially for that end example. Um, if things are too far away, it feels like they don't belong. So when that line height's massive, um, doesn't feel like the paragraph is all together. And balance as well, that kind of first example, um, it's not a very pleasing distribution of weight across the page. The other element is paragraph spacing. <clears throat> so this is um, spaces uh, before and after paragraphs and headings. So again, I've got another example of this here, one bad and one good. So let's have a look at the good one. Um, so here, our spacing sort of between the paragraph copy, so this bit here, um, and after the heading, it should be about the same, should be relatively equal. And this ensures that that section of text all looks like it belongs together, but it still gives the kind of natural breaks uh, in between as you would read it. Uh, and then the spacing at the end of the paragraph, but before the next heading, that should be larger. That indicates that that's the end of that section of text. Um, and you get that moment of pause. And that should be followed throughout um, your paragraphs after that as well. So 
If we compare that to our example on the left, um, we can start to see why that paragraph spacing is so imperative. You know, the proximity principle was not followed on this one. Um, the things that should be near each other are not, um, or they're too close together, or, you know, it's all out of whack. Um, so it doesn't help us connect that content together in a natural way that we would read it. Um, so yes, it can be very easily missed, um, and it does make a world of difference um, to the design. So, uh, let's move on to some tips about color. So, what I want to cover today is just some tips around creating a color palette uh, to use across your design. Um, so, again, you might just be starting completely from scratch and not even know where to start uh, with your colors. So, my main tip here is to start with one. Start with the main color that you want to associate with the brand that you're working on. So, think like EasyJet's orange, Starbucks green, Twitch is purple, they've all got a main color. And then once we've got that, we can start to build out three distinct color palettes. So a main palette, this will be your first color that you've chosen um, there, and then a really small selection of other commonly used colors. Uh, a supporting palette, so this will be less commonly used colors, but more of them, um, so a bigger choice. And then neutrals, um, this is a set of kind of uh, neutral shades to add a bit of flexibility. So rather than creating one from scratch here, I thought I would kind of show an example of a set of these color palettes that's used. So um, I'm going to use Uber as an example um, of this. So this is Uber's main color palette. Um, starting with one color, they started with black. Um, so that was their kind of first main color. Uh, then to add to this palette, they chose white. Uh, reason being, black and white, really contrasting colors. If we think back to that principle from the start. Um, colors are a great way of achieving contrast, so do consider this when creating a color palette. Um, and then additionally, they have this third uh, color in the main palette, this blue. And this blue works really well against the white. It works really well against the black. Um, and they use it as more of a kind of highlight or accent color. Uh, within that main palette. So just some examples of that. Uh, this is their website and the app here. Just don't look at my rating, uh, anything. Uh, it's not that bad, actually. It's improved since the last time I gave this talk. <laughs> so uh, here on their website and on the app, you can really see how they've implemented these uh, main colors. So you know, black and white is really integral to how you can read everything really well on the site. Um, but then you start to see where they bring in this blue um, as a highlight color. You know, on the website, it's shown here to um, highlight some of their kind of product range. Um, and on the app, they use it really well to highlight you know, where I need to uh, sort out my security settings, because I haven't done that for some reason. Uh, and also, I've got um, a message there, so they use it to um, really highlight where you need to, to look. Uh, and then this is Uber's secondary color palette. So it contains twice as many colors, um, but they're used a lot less within the branding. So that's the kind of balance that you need to achieve with that. Um, and again, these colors are chosen because they work well against the ones that are in the main palette. So here's where we can see those colors and shades of those colors as well. That's quite important. Um, being used to communicate through illustration, mostly. Uh, and they're from the website, and again, on the app, um, they use uh, these colors here. So as well as this, you can also see where they have their neutral tones. So this is uh, us talking about that third palette, the neutral tones. Uh, can you see it? Oh, yeah, you can see it on the screen. That's good. My last one, you couldn't really see it. Um, but having uh, some neutrals like this gives you a bit of flex flexibility. Uh, here, it kind of indicates where you've got interactive, uh, kind of clickable areas. Um, so yeah, having a palette structure like this, it helps with your design, but it also creates a sense of hierarchy. You know, your main colors are going to be used uh, first and foremost, um, and then your supporting and your neutrals. So choosing colors, there are some tools for that. Uh, firstly, Adobe colors. I like this one a lot because you can choose that, you know, that first color that we talked about, um, and then you can set up palettes from that point. You know, you can pick uh, complementary colors, uh, monochromatic shades and everything from there. 
or if you don't know where to start at all, uh, coolers.co is really cool. It's quite random, um, and you can generate colors from here. Both of these tools also have uh, contrast, color contrast checkers. Um, so many other people speak a lot better about accessibility than I ever could, but I just wanted to point it out when setting up colors. Uh, as developers, you've got a lot of accessibility standards to meet. As a designer, picking colors is uh, the lowest bar to meet, so uh, do make sure that you are checking for color contrast there. So let's discuss a couple of elements around imagery. So, you might be working with some photos in your design, um, which is great, but uh, you might be having some trouble making them look good. Um, and a lot of the time, it can come down to getting the focal point right, um, quite simply. So let's take this image. Um, this person here is clearly the focal point. Uh, he is the subject of our image. Um, but if we just chuck this into a design, and crop it automatically, it's not gonna work. Our automatic cropping is gonna crop out his head or crop off the side of him because he's not within the center of that image. So we just need to consider the frame that our image is gonna sit in first. Is it square? Is it landscape? Is it portrait? Um, we've just gotta make sure that that subject is sitting in the right place uh, and isn't cut out the frame. You might also be working with more complex image containers as well, um, in which case, you know, Diamonds and circles are a bit trickier um, when it comes to the focal point because they crop out a lot more. Um, so do make sure that you are uh, paying attention to that. Uh, as well as that, there's image treatment. So how can you enhance or add a bit of interest to your imagery? Think kind of filters and effects. Like you don't need Photoshop these days. Uh, to do that, you know, social media as well as the editing tools and cameras on our phones have made that a hell of a lot easier. Uh, and more familiar. So here's an example of a really simple effect uh, applied to an image, just a good old black and white filter. Uh, it's a simple approach, but it can also add some consistency to your photos, which, uh, if they're coming from different sources, can sometimes be a bit of a problem. And here's another example of how you can do that. These are pictures of the speakers so far from FFConf. Um, and this is how these have had the same sort of treatment. These pictures were all taken, different places, different cameras, different lighting, um, and what has been done is an image treatment across them all, so they're more, more consistent, and also line up with the branding of the conference as well, which is cool. Uh, alternatively, you could always go for something else, a little funkier, like a, like a 2015 Spotify approach uh, with Duo with Tone. <laughs> Another way that you can maybe make photos more on brand, or um, something like this with cutouts. That I think this is what my clients mean uh, when they ask me to make it pop. I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but yeah, adding effects, it's not always necessary, but it can sometimes be something that you might want to experiment with. Um, as well as that, if you're looking for a free resource for photos, uh, Unsplash is a good resource. Uh, it's free. Stock imagery that's uh, free to use. Uh, they have quite a wide range of images, and they don't all fall into the trap of like the cheesy meme. <laughs> These are all stock images. Like, they don't really fall into that trap, so Unsplash is a great tool. Uh, I just want to touch on one thing around iconography, because I don't think it's really rocket science uh, to a lot of us, but iconography is something we use a lot across the web. Uh, cool. So these kind of icons, with icons, it's really easy when we're creating a design to assume that the user knows what they mean just because we do. But there are some typical icons we see every day, um, and we know what they mean. Um, we know what's going to happen when we click them. These are kind of three examples of that. You know, we know that that's going to be a search. We know that that's going to be a menu. We know that's a delete action. Uh, and these are what we call universal icons. But consider what these icons might represent. You know, it might not be as familiar, it might not be as obvious. Uh, that heart could mean like, the middle one could be a repost, that last one might be a link to live chat, or they might not be. Um, it might not be that obvious, it might mean something different in the context they're in. So my one tip for icons is that uh, 
give them a label. Um, if it's not immediately obvious what they do, um, giving them a label will make that a hell of a lot easier for the user to know what's going to happen. Um, quick one for icons, another resource. Uh, fontawesome.com is cool. I use this quite a lot. Um, they have a huge amount of icons. They're vector and font uh, formats, so they never lose fidelity. Uh, and they offer free and paid packages. And there is shit, almost 20,000 icons on there, so it grows all the time. Uh, it's a great, great little tool. Uh, so lastly, before I go to the kind of before and afters, I want to talk about layout. Um, so this is where we kind of start putting those pieces together. So I'd like to start with a grid, or at least columns. Um, this is to give you a guide on where you're going to put elements on a page. So typically, it's good to use a column structure um, that is divisible by a load of different numbers. So uh, that's why a 12 column grid is fantastic. Um, it's my go-to when working for the web. Um, you know, it's divisible by two, three, four, six, one in itself, I guess. Uh, <laughs> this, uh, this makes it really versatile for responsive design. Um, but what's most important is that it helps us maintain that principle of balance. So here's that typical 12 column layout. Now, I know this is not a revolutionary concept at all. Um, but it's, in front end development, it's not revolutionary. In design, uh, it is even less of a modern concept. You know, these kind of grid systems have been around since books were being printed, so designers have been familiar with this for a while. Uh, but I just want to highlight that the structure that it can bring to our design. And when we're considering those design principles um, in balance and also proximity as well. So, you know, we can have a two column section here. Um, and if we imagine what these kind of squares could contain, symmetrically balanced, it could be two of the same things. It could be two columns of text um, or two images. Asymmetrically balanced, you know, you might have a big image on one side and some text that kind of matches that um, weight on the page as well. Um, and then we can think about how that works across three columns, four columns, or even six as well. So grids are just, and columns are uh, just a great way of giving you a guide on where to put stuff um, on the page. So once we've got a grid, cool. Let's talk about the stuff that goes into those squares. Um, so this is looking at creating kind of repeatable components um, and how we build those up from the ground up. So I'm going to borrow really heavily from Brad Frost's uh, atomic design methodology here, which I'm sure plenty of you have heard of. Um, but if you haven't, uh, atomic design is a framework that's used um, to help us kind of break down a layout into a system of smaller elements. So they use the following kind of names uh, to describe how we build a component, going from atoms to molecules to organisms. That eventually goes to pages and templates as well, but I'm going to stick to these. So what does that mean in terms of UI? So if we start with atoms, um, atoms here could be an image, a title, a price tag. They're really kind of small um, individual elements. So like atoms in nature, they're important, but they don't uh, work very well as the singular. Uh, and that's where molecules come in. So molecules are uh, where two or more atoms uh, combine in order to create a larger part of the interface. So uh, our single atoms here, our image, our title, and our price tag, they merge to become a molecule. So things are starting to look a bit more put together now. Uh, here's another example of some atoms, you know, button, uh, icon, and link there. Um, and we combine them, and they form another molecule. Um, so, looking at organisms in a similar fashion to molecules, this is where we combine two or more molecules. So if we look at our two molecules that we created earlier, once we combine them, then we've got an organism. Then we've got something more tangible to play with there. Um, and then, if we think about our grid system, here we've got the kind of four columns from before. We take our organism, we put it in there, and then we start to repeat it. Um, and then we're starting to get a bigger picture. A page is starting to come together. Then if we add 
more organisms, you know, a filter system, a sort by system, you know, you keep adding to this um, and you're obviously building up a page. My point here, and my tip, is that if you're getting really overwhelmed by creating an entire page, break it down, start really small, start with the atoms, uh, and then build up from there. Uh, so I will put this resource here because I've absolutely bastardized it for this five minutes of talking. <laughs> um, so this is the uh, Atomic Design resource uh, by Brad Frost. I think it started as a blog and now it's a book. I think that's the way around it happened. Um, but yeah, do check it out. Um, it's, uh, it's great. So, um, as like the last final bit of my talk, um, I want to end with some examples of how we can refine some existing designs. So I find that talking through the kind of how and why and the bits and the bobs at the start is great. Um, but by far, some of the best feedback I've had from devs is kind of showing a before and after um, and how we get to that point. So I've got a couple examples to show. Uh, so if we start with this, this is a kind of card concept here, an organism, if you will. Um, and this is one from a property website. And this is something I've been looking at all year and have given up on because of the state of the UK economy now. I'm never going to get a house, but anyway, I digress. Uh, <laughs> um, so what we've got here is um, we've got all the information we need. We've got everything we need on this card. You know, it's functional. It works. Uh, we've got the price. We've got the location. We've got the spec. And we've got a call to action as well as an image gallery. Uh, but let's have a look at how we can improve this. How can we refine that design? So both of these cards display the same information. Um, they perform the same functions. There's just a big difference in how that's communicated. Um, so let's start with the price. Uh, we've identified that as the key kind of element we want to pull out. Well, it's not the thing I want to focus on, but it's the thing that the person selling the house is focusing on. So, um, so yeah, that's the biggest bit of information now on the page, so we're thinking about the hierarchy uh, if we're looking back at those principles. Um, and then we've got our kind of spec. We could declutter this, add a bit of interest to it here. Uh, so what we've done is taken out the spec, added icons. Uh, again, I kind of in this context, the icons probably make sense, uh, but I've still labeled them anyway, just in case you don't know what the bed and the bath mean um, on there. Uh, so, at the bottom, we've added a bit of contrast here with this kind of um, pull that area in a neutral tone. Uh, but we've, what we've done is pulled out the contact details and put them all together, proximity principle here. Um, so we've pulled out the logo for the agent uh, and the number, and then revised this kind of call to action, made it a nice big button, given it a load of contrast on there. The last thing is the photo gallery. So before, the controls were kind of somewhere near it. Uh, maybe not as obvious that it relates to that. So we've thought about proximity here. We've put the controls on the image, uh, as well as the kind of image counter there, um, to make that clear that those two things correlate. So same function, just a little bit different. Uh, so let's look at this pop-up here. So this lesson is mostly in hierarchy, but also a little bit of microcopy as well. Um, so, what's the problem with this example? I mean, again, it works, um, but this is a kind of permanent action that someone's going to take here. Um, and the warning for it, I mean, on this screen it's massive, obviously, but at real size, that warning would be really small. Uh, also, the buttons here, they just have no real difference bar the yes and no. Um, it doesn't really help that user make a decision quickly. So, if we look at how we can improve this, Let's think about that warning. That's probably one of the most important things we need to tell the user. So we've moved that up to the top, um, giving it a bit of an eye-catching icon to make sure that you're going to read that. Uh, secondly, we've adjusted the text on the buttons. Um, yes and no kind of makes sense. Uh, but let's really make it clear to the user what action they're going to take. You know, they're going to delete or they're going to cancel and not make this decision now. Um, as well as that, I flipped them around. It's debatable. Again, Design Twitter will probably 
uh, debate with you about whether the uh, primary action should be on the right. Um, take that or leave that. Um, and as well as that, last thing is kind of the contrast that we're applying here. Um, so the primary action button is filled. It's red as well to give context that it's delete. Um, and then we've got an outline button for the kind of secondary action. So we've got a hierarchy in uh, and contrast in the buttons there as well. Third one here is um, how do we make a radio button choice a bit more interesting? So this does the job. This is us comparing some data plans. Um, but what can we do to this to make it a bit better? Again, we're performing the same functions, but how do we just apply some good design? So let's consider the hierarchy here. What is the main thing that is the difference between these? It's the size of the data package. So let's pull that out as the biggest thing, the thing that's going to catch your eye the most. Um, we'll keep that price bold as well, because that's also a differentiator here between these two. But it's the more secondary one. Uh, second, we will put these big choices into some nice big block components. Uh, this is creating a sense of balance in our layout, um, but it's also kind of clearly separating uh, our options better than that radio button style. Uh, and lastly is the selected state on this. So this offers some real high contrast. It's really obvious which one's been chosen. Um, we've got like a hard line on it. We've got an icon. There's a lot going on to tell you that that is uh, the choice that's been made. So some big contrast on there as well. Again, just really simple kind of incremental changes there. Um, I realize I may be running to time, so I'm going to skip this one. But this is just applying some different textiles and proximities. Uh, the last one here is a hero section of a website. So uh, this, is, this is cool. Um, we've got an image, we've got title, description, two buttons, nav. Uh, but I can't see the cat. Uh, that's really important to me. Can't, can't see it. Um, so here, this is us looking kind of the framing of an image. Um, we've got a lot of space to play with on this image. Um, so let's move it so that we can see the cat. It's beautiful. beautiful cat. Um, and the text here, uh, because we've got that now, we can have some really high contrast with the text. We've got black on yellow. Um, and we're also, again, thinking about that hierarchy of buttons. Let's pull out the most important one and make sure that that um, has got the highest sort of contrast. Um, and we're also looking at that in the navigation as well. Um, so yes, thank you very much. Um. <laughs>